this talk is going to be about data processing with Apache Beam. It'll be in the similar vein if you were in this session earlier where we talked about how to use data science R and Python with Apache Spark. And Beam is a different take on trying to solve a similar problem where how do you use Python for running data processing pipeline using different execution frameworks. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Saurabh. I work as a software engineer. And I spend a lot of time on Twitter for some reason. And so now that you guys know more about me, let's talk about what is Beam. So what is Apache Beam? Um, Apache Beam is a unified data processing framework for expressing efficient and portable data processing pipelines. So here, this is a long, lengthy definition. I want to talk about two key keywords here. Unified and portable. Um, by unified, what I mean here is the Beam model should be able to express a lot of different use cases that we see in the common data processing paradigm. So these can be batch pipelines that might run daily, monthly, things like that, or streaming pipelines that are continuously running from a source such as Kafka, and you're doing stream processing on those. And then the next thing I want to highlight is portable. So in the Beam model, your pipeline should be able to run on any of the execution frameworks that you choose. So the user from Beam's perspective writes a graph and expresses their pipeline in Beam. And that pipeline should be able to run on any execution framework, such as Apache Spark, Apache Flink, or Google Cloud Dataflow. So currently, Beam supports different runners. And the and they all provide a consistent API for running and defining your pipeline. So as we dive more into these two paradigms, first let's talk about what kind of data do we see in today's use cases, and how do different data processing jobs make trade-offs around what is the right framework for them. So let's say you were a mobile gaming company, and you launched your new favorite famous game called Geometry Crush, where people were asked to click on different geometrical shapes, and they earn points using that. And this game becomes really popular. All across the globe, people are submitting, your, playing your game on any plane, any train, any bus that you ride. And you're constantly collecting scores. Your data grows. And in your warehouse, you come up with an intelligent strategy of sharding your data by day. And all your analytics is done on this. But in all honesty, what your data actually looks like is a continuous stream coming in. And if somebody is playing your game at 8 o'clock in the morning, you see that data come in immediately. And this person might have very good network, and you see that score. If somebody was in a train and they were in a tunnel for a while, you might see their score like 10 minutes late. And if they were on an aircraft playing your game, you might even see the score like six hours later. So this, like this data is unbounded as you're constantly getting in streams, and it's delayed, and delayed by a not well-defined paradigm. So in most streaming pipelines, what you do in these cases is you bucket your data in certain fashion, where you can say, I'm going to calculate date values per hour by bucketing my data from 12 to 1, 1 to 2. But all this is based on what time did you receive the data, and not on what time did your event happen. So at Beam, we try to process, differentiate between these two concepts of when the event actually happened and when you're actually processing this data. So in most data processing jobs here, you're kind of making a trade-off between three different choices. Where what kind, what kind of completeness do you see? So how correct or good are your results? So because of late data, you can't actually out correctly say, hey, I've seen everything from for the window of 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock at 3 in the afternoon. That's definitely not true, because somebody might be on a plane. Or latency. So if you decided to wait too long and say, I'm going to wait 24 hours for my data to show up so that I can guarantee that I've seen everything, you're still only getting results once every 24 hours instead of getting results continuously. And then there's cost where people don't want to spend too much on running these jobs. So minimizing cost for every one of these jobs is definitely important. So to drive this point home, I want to talk about how different use cases make trade-offs between these three dimensions. So here on the y-axis, I've plotted importance. 
So the higher the bar, the more important we think this, this dimension is for this job. And on the x-axis, we have the three dimensions of completeness, latency, and cost. So let's say you were a SaaS company which runs a monthly pipeline. So every time a user makes an API call to your service, you bill them a certain amount. And at the end of the month, you just count number of API calls received per account and bill them. So here, completeness is very, very important. Your business is based on a trust that you're like counting these API calls correctly, you're not overcharging your users. So here we want to guarantee that the results are as correct as possible. While latency is not that important. This pipeline runs once a month, so if it takes two hours versus three hours, that's not the end of the world. And you're only gonna get results once a month. It's not a continuous learning pipeline. And low cost is not that important because this is a monthly job, so if it costs you a certain extra amount for getting 100% correct results, it should be okay. But for the same case, let's say you wanted to give a running estimate of the bill to the user so that they're not surprised at the end of the month by getting a huge bill, or if one of their services goes wild and starts making a whole bunch of API calls to your system, you should, they should see an uptick in their estimate and not only get the results at the end of the month. So here we can compromise just a bit on the completeness. Your estimates can't be too off, but they don't need to be 100% correct constantly. Uh, but we want to get the results much more faster. So instead of getting them once, a mo once per month, you want to see something update at least like every 10 minutes or so. And because this is an estimate pipeline, this is not reliable. Like, you, can, you want to save on cost because you're slightly compromising on result, correctness of the results, so you want to save a bit on the cost. And moving this like, to a different domain, and let's say we had a fraud detection pipeline. Here, completeness becomes much, more, much less important because you're mostly trying to minimize false negatives, where any fraud that might have leaked through your system, your objective is to catch that. And latency is very, very important here because you want to catch any fraud that happens as soon as it happens. So if you see a credit card making transactions where it shouldn't, you want to block that card immediately. And presumably low cost is slightly less important than our billing estimate pipeline because a cost of a fraud is much, much higher than running the pipeline. So that shouldn't be a problem. So now that we have seen these use cases, and how different pipelines interact between exactness and latency. Let's talk about how the Beam model tries to build a paradigm where it lets the user decide what kind of choices it wants to make. So before we dive into the Beam model, I want to clarify certain terms that you might see, hear me talk about. So what is a pipeline? A pipeline is an execution DAG where this is the steps that the user asks the input data to go through. So these can be like, hey, there are two different input streams. I want to go, I want to go ask them to go through each of these transformations or make them join. Somewhere then output to a sync, which might be a database or text file somewhere. And then a single transformation is called a p-transform where this is a parallelizable transform. So this transform is, can be applied to different parts of the stream in different workers. And similarly, the data that goes between a single transform to another transform or from a transform to a sink, from a source to a transform, is a P collection. So a P collection is kind of like a set of elements which might be infinite in size. And you might not be able to observe all of it if it's a streaming source such as Kafka. So that's what bounded and unbounded P collections mean, where a bounded P collection is something where your data is static, where if you're doing data processing on a fixed set of files, you already know when this data ends. While if you were reading from, let's say, Twitter for a Twitter stream, you don't know when it's going to end because you might constantly be getting, getting new tweets. Uh, so now that we have clarified those terminologies, I briefly touched upon event time and processing time. So event time is the time when the event actually happened. So if somebody is playing the mobile game at 8 o'clock, the event time is 8. And processing time is at what pro time are you processing this data? So in case of a streaming pipeline, 
your event time versus processing time, processing time are very close to each other. You try to process the data as soon as that happens or your system sees it. While if you were running a batch pipeline, you might be processing data which is a year old. So your event time is a year ago and your processing time is what when your pipeline is running. So to explain the Beam model, we try to phrase the conversation around asking four different questions where what is being computed? Where in event time is it being computed? When in processing time is it being computed? And how do you refine any results that you might see because of late data? Um, so first, what is being computed? Here, so this code snippet, what we try to do is we have an input pipeline, and we want to pipe this output input through a P transform called sum.integer per key, where this is similar to Let's say you had a reducer, which was doing sum over all the integers that were attached to particular keys. So as an example would be, if you were calculating cumulative scores for each user in the last day or last 24 hours, something like that. And here we haven't added any notion of what time do we want to calculate this so far. So this is very similar to what a typical batch pipeline would look like, where you have data and you assume that you have seen everything in the future or in the past. So all you're doing is calculating a rolling sum. So in the batch case, you're not waiting for future data or something like that. And you would get one output for one key. So for one user, you're gonna get one value out right now. And, but let's say we wanted, for this we had to know that all the event time data has been collected. So the next thing is, we want to say we want to window our event time and generate an output per window. So, so in this snippet, what we do is, if you look at the blue line, we're saying window my input stream into fixed windows of two minute size each. So what you're gonna see is, in your input stream, there'll be buckets of two minute windows each, and you're gonna get a sum which is for that window. So now the number of output you are going to see is basically one sum for each user, each window. So that would look something like this, where for every two minute window, you're getting an output value. But as you know here, that still we are assuming that for a particular window, we have seen all the data for that window. So for a window from 12 o'clock to 12 or two, we have seen all that data and that is the sum we are calculating. So this is kind of like windowed batch where we were calculating, let's say you had a KPI around number of active users per day, and we want to say, hey, split my stream based on per day, like per day, and then calculate number of active users in that window. And this is what a windowed batch pipeline generally looks like. And now let's say we added a notion of, so before we talk about processing time, Beam allows you to specify three different sorts of windows, where in the previous example, we saw fixed windows, which were like, hey, calculate, give me a sum per hour, give me a sum per day, something like that. But you could also have rolling windows, where you're constantly doing a rolling sum, where number of active users per last 24 days, or last 28 days, which is a typical metric. Or you could have session windows, where let's say you wanted to calculate number of different URLs that a user visited in particular session of their activity on your web app. So if somebody is on your site, how many different URLs do they go to in their particular session? And these sessions can vary, right? Like some user only visit two URLs and their sessions are two minutes in length, or if somebody sticks around on your YouTube site and watches 50 different videos, they have a session which is multiple hours in length. So here the session window is defined per key. So these three window, windowing concepts allow you to define like more powerful pipelines. And now we should add a notion of what, what happens in processing time. So for processing time cases, Beam has a notion of something called a watermark. Um, so let me describe what a watermark is. So a water, running watermark is our best estimate of till what point in the past have we collected all the data for. So let's say we were doing running a pipeline right now, and it's about four o'clock. 
And we know that everything that would have happened from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock should have reached our system. So that means our watermark can be at three, could have been ahead of 3 o'clock. But we can't say the same about the window from 3 to 4. So our watermark is somewhere in the middle from 3 to 4. So at this point in time, it is safe to calculate the results for the window which was 2 to 3. But it's not safe to calculate the results for window which is 3 to 4, even though it's been passed 4. But we know there's certain data that is still either in certain buffers or still might be in the network. So now if we go back to our visualization, this is slowly evolving from a batch pipeline into a streaming pipeline, where the green bar here kind of reflects what our watermark looks like, where at every point in the time, this was our estimate of where we have seen the data for. And whenever we, the watermark passed a certain window, we were able to output the result for that window because our notion of saying, hey, we have seen this data, matches. But as you know, there's this red dot, which is, hey, there was a one data point that came much more after what we thought the watermark had progressed to. So this event that happened at 9.01 actually showed up like much, much late. And we had already processed windows ahead of that. So next, we are going to talk about how do, what do we do in case of such late data, and how do we refine our results. So now, We've talked about what a watermark is. And we're going to talk about a concept called triggers and firings, where let's say for a particular window, we said our window is one hour. But we wanted to get an estimate result fired every 10 minutes. So in a sense, you can sort of say that for a particular window, you're tagging the result by either early, which is, hey, I might not have seen all the data for this window. But this is kind of an estimated value that I expect to be the output. Or an on-time firing where when the watermark crosses a particular window, you're saying, hey, this is the result I would have seen. So this was what we were doing in the previous case. And then a late firing where every time late data comes in, just send me an updated value. And based on these, any downstream consumer can decide what they need to do, where if they want to use the early results, they can choose to use them or discard them. If they see any late data, they can do an update. So if the update is safe and they can mutate the previous records, then they could do that and get more correct results. If it's not, they can choose to discard that. And this is how like Beam deals with any sort of late data and guarantees like you're constantly correcting your results. Um, there are different modes of updating in Beam. And for more details, there's like a full paper called the data flow model, or if you go to the Beam website. Um, so this is what like, hey, for a particular window, we saw multiple outputs being generated, and not just one, as we saw in our previous use cases. So this was like a huge crash course in the Beam model. Um, there's definitely more information available on the Beam site. And if we walk through the four questions again, like. Customizing the what, where, when, and how actually helped us evolve the same model to become a classic batch pipeline where there was one window from minus infinity to infinity to a streaming pipeline that could handle late data. And there are more examples on the Beam website or the Google Cloud Dataflow website, so you should definitely check that out. And I'm going to stop talking about the Beam model here and walk through some examples of what the Beam API actually looks like for writing real-world pipelines. Um, so as word count is probably the most popular example for data processing, I've never seen a framework not do it. <laughs> so let's do that. Um, as Python developers, the first thing I would do is import a whole bunch of stuff. And then, so here, Beam is what we are saying is we start with a pipeline, and the with clause here essentially the with context is helping you run the pipeline. So when you exit the context, we are going to run the pipeline for you. And a pipe operator means apply this p transform to my pipeline right now. So in this first line, what we are saying is read some text data from this input file. And read from text is a built-in transform. You can implement your own transforms as well. Um, 
and in read from text, now our P collection, when this, in P, this transform has been applied, looks something like a set where each element is a line in this text file. Next, we pass this P, P collection through a flat map where we split each line into words. So now our P collection after this transform would look something like where every element is one word. And next, we run, run it through a combiner. So combiners here sort of work similar to how combiners worked in MapReduce, where you can, they are essentially doing a group by key, where you're doing a group by on each of these words, and then counting the number of times this has been seen. So this beam combiner is actually a combination inside of a group by key and doing a sum implementation. And it's slightly more efficient because you can push some of the computation on the map task as well. Next, we format our output into something that is a string we want to write to a text file. So now we're getting key value pairs where the first thing was the word that we saw and the C was the count. And we're just generating a string which says word colon number of times we saw that. And to end this, we are going to write the output back into a text file, which says we're going to use the write to text transform, and we're going to just write that output into a directory. And you could use any other file system here, such as S3 or GCS or any remote file system. Um, so if you look at this pipeline, here nowhere have we defined a notion of what execution framework are we tied to. So this pipeline is actually able to run either on like Google Cloud Dataflow, on your local machine, or, or in Spark or Flink. So currently, Python only supports Direct Runner and Dataflow. But if you were to use the Java Beam API, you would be able to run the exact same pipeline on Spark or Flink or Apex. And next, let's, so this was a typical batch pipeline. And we're going to slowly evolve this into a streaming pipeline. So a typical string, streaming example I see is like, trending on Twitter. So if you have been on Twitter, on the left side they show what are the most popular hashtags in some duration, which I don't know what it is. And we're going to kind of try to calculate the exact same thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to find the most popular hashtags in the last five minutes at any given point of time. So here, similar to our previous case, we are going to read from a streaming source this time. So PubSub is similar to Kafka, which is a hosted service on Google Cloud. And you could use Kafka here for what it's worth. And so we have this Twitter topic that is constantly give, sending us tweets. And we don't know when this data is going to end. So we try to window our output into input data into five minute windows. And these are sliding windows. So our window moves one minute at a time. And the size of the window is five minutes. So at any given minute, we can get the most popular hashtags in the last five minutes. So next, let's say we had a parsing function. So for like the sake of the example, I don't know what the Twitter tweet looks like, but we had, a, we had implemented a function that went through this J, tweet JSON, took all the hashtags out, and created elements for each of the hashtags. So now your P collection is basically a stream of hashtags each of them are tied to a particular window they were assigned to. And if you see a single hashtag would belong to five different windows here, because we have a sliding window of five minute in size. So a single element is going to go through five different windows, because the window progresses one minute at a time. Next, we're going to run this combiner again. And the combiner is now actually going to calculate the sum per window. So we're going to see how many times were a particular hashtag seen in a sliding window. So this combiner is going to generate, like, the hashtags is going to be counted in five different windows this time. And now we do the same thing as how we were outputting, but this time we try to output to a database. So in this example, I output to BigQuery, but you could write to Cassandra or MySQL or any other database. And so basically, the first thing we are doing is formatting the output to be readable by whatever the database's ingestion system reads, and then just writing that out. And next, 
like your service or web app can basically query this database for like top most popular things and do calculate hashtags this way. So we saw that the same syntax we saw for word count, which was for a batch pipeline, slowly evolved into a streaming pipeline where we were doing like rolling sums on a stream. And the API barely changed. Actually, the only line we essentially added was windowed into. And now we were doing windowed sums. And so this is, now I want to use the time I have left to talk about what is the vision for Beam and uh, portability. So I've constantly mentioned that you can run your Beam pipeline on different execution engines. So now I want to walk through the architecture for what enables Beam to actually do this. Um, so currently, Beam Java supports five different execution runners, where which is Google Cloud, Dataflow, Apache Spark, Apache Flink, Apache Apex, and GearPump. I think GearPump is still incubating. Um, so to dive more into this, so first thing we see and what the user interacts with is a pipeline SDK. So you can see an SDK in your particular fam like favorite language, where there is a Java SDK, there's a Python SDK, and you could assume there's an R SDK or other languages in the future. And the user is going to use the same primitives we saw about like windowing or flat map or map to write their pipeline graph. So now once they have specified what their DAG looks like, we're going to convert this graph into a language agnostic standard format. So here, there are two things to note. You would still have closures that are serialized and that can only be unserialized in your particular language. So if you were using a Python function, we would pickle the function, and only, unpick, only Python would be able to unpickle it. But this graph is basically defining what the, what the P transformer nodes are actually made of. So this, the, there are primitive nodes that the graph understands. So hey, this is a pardo, this is a map, this is a group by key, and your graph is defined using those and every node is tied to a UUID or URN, which is across, say, consistent across different languages. So now that you have formed this language agnostic representation of your pipeline graph, you still need something to understand what your primitives look, would, how your primitives would execute in that particular language. So corresponding to each SDK, there is an execution harness that is tied to it. So for, let's say, Python, this execution harness is the one that's going to like depickle your code and run it across all elements. So the execution harness provides a consistent environment for executing your code. So if you had a Python 3.6 SDK, it would be tied to a Python 3.6 SDK running harness. And you might be able to augment that with by installing other libraries that you're using. But now, no matter what runner you were using, because this is a Docker-based environment, this is consistent across wherever you take it. So if you were running in your local machine, you're still getting the same execution harness, which your remote execution framework might use. So if Spark spins up a worker, if they spin up the exact same execution harness, they get the consistent environment. So you're not having a mismatch between how your pipeline ran on one framework versus the other one, and you're not tuning your environment constantly. But as we see these execution harnesses in different languages, right? Like you had a Java harness, you had a Python harness. We still need a consistent API for all of these to talk to what the execution framework looks like. So this is where Fun API comes in, where this is a consistent API that is exposed by all of these Docker containers. And this is how they send or receive data or report metrics, report errors, anything that might happen. And so now we have basically with this diagram, right? We have consistent created a consistent representation of what the user's graph looked like and a consistent API which each of the workers speak. And you can kind of assume where I'm going with this, where now you have different runners. So the runners basically sit in the middle where they understand the common representation of each runner API graph. They also understand how to talk to different workers using the fun API. And then each execution framework is still responsible for managing resources across, 
across different machines or coordinating work between different workers. But no part of the runner or what language the runner supports is integrated with what language the user can write their pipeline in. So like because they're talking over a particular API protocol, Spark can talk to the fun, like Haskell for Hannes using the fun API. And it doesn't matter if the execution worker is talk, learning, is running Haskell or Python or R because, and Spark is written in Scala. That's, they're, like, those two are like now separate concepts. And this is how we try to like, this is what Beam envisions and to be the future so that you can take your pipeline and run it wherever you want. You shouldn't be able to having to re-implement your pipeline constantly based on like, hey, this is my language or this is wh what runner I'm committed to today. And um, so there are different parts which you can help out on. Beam is an open source project. It's a top level Apache project now. And um, you can either help with writing different SDKs. You can help define the runner API and fun API graphs. You can help with writing new execution systems or adding more runners which support these protocols. Um, so to learn more about Beam, you can check the Beam website. Uh, all the code is available on GitHub. Currently, we have uh, two SDKs. All the issues are tracked on Jira. And there are two mailing lists which are definitely worth checking out. One is a user mailing list where if you're using Beam and you want to give feedback about what, you're, like, what you found hard, what you found easy, how can we improve, what sort of new connectors should we add, definitely help us give that feedback there. Or there's a developer mailing list. So if you want to help out and if you're just starting out and don't know where to begin, um, that might be a good place to start where we can help you find the right Jira issue for you to tackle and help you pair up with someone who might be able to guide you as well. So um, at this point, thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And I can, you can find me online. I can answer anything. Thank you, Saurabh. Yeah. If anybody has questions, they can tweet them here at, <laughs> at Pi, Pi Data Seattle. So you gave us a couple of simple examples using Beam. Have you implemented anything more complicated in a Beam diagram already? Yes. Um, so basically, uh, so Beam is the primary SDK which is used by um, like Google Cloud Dataflow, and there are a lot of users who like run jobs which do a petabyte shuffles and complicated streaming jobs. And um, if you look at, if you go on the Beam website, there's the mobile gaming example is actually implemented where we go through a stream and update data for like, if you see late data, what happens? And all the things we talked about and all these concepts are actually implemented as one example where you see the pipeline evolve. So that might be a good place to check out. Thank you. Uh, questions in the room? Thank you. Checking Twitter real quick here. Yes. Um, hmm. so. yes, go for it. The, um, the syntax that you used on some of those slides had, had a pipe character in it, and I'm not really familiar with that syntax. Oh, yeah. So basically, in Beam, we kind of override the or character to say, hey, this is a P transform that want, I want to pipe my output through, yeah. or like pipe my input through this. Oh. Yeah, so it's not a Python specific thing. It's a Beam thing, yeah. Yes? This looks like, is this a good development option to use for implementing like the <coughs> successor to Lambda architecture or Kappa architecture? Yes, so basically you can kind of implement either any one of those with Beam where Essentially, Lambda or Kappa require you to run a batch pipeline as well as a streaming pipeline. But what we hope is with the implementation of how we handle late data, you can kind of achieve the exact same results with, without running the batch pipeline in parallel with the streaming pipeline. Because the reason we did that, you do Lambda architecture, is because you're not sure that your stream had processed all the data or not. And you want, you're kind of like fixing the result post hoc with a batch pipeline. So if you had a good way to handle late data, I think you would be able to achieve the same result with the exact streaming pipeline itself. 
And this is what we are kind of hoping to do. But you could definitely write your bad job and streaming job using Beam as well. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk about the adoption of the current status of the adoption in the industry? You mentioned that um, there are several folks using this already. Yes. Um, what kind of adoption are you seeing? Can you give us a couple of specific adoption examples? Yeah, so uh, one example is Spotify basically maintains a Scala SDK. They haven't given it back. There's an open issue about like giving it back to the Beam community, but all of Spotify pipelines are sort of written in Beam is an example. And Spotify does a lot of stream processing because of like their music player and continuous data coming in. Um, the Beam community has had like 200 odd committers who work in like different organizations and use that. Uh, Flink is actually uh, like Flink or Data Art is like several people from the Fl Apache Flink PMC also are committers on Beam and help out with like build, driving Beam adoption for like the Flink uh, execution system. Yeah. All right, just as a reminder, we're getting near the end of our time session. If you want to make it to your next session, it's about five minutes until the start of the next one. So what is your favorite implementation in Beam right now? What, what project was the most fun for you or the, the most interesting to implement in Beam? Uh, actually, for me, it was, uh, I think, seeing the fun API and the runner API vision evolve and defining those to be a language agnostic system where you, it was much more easier to add new languages where without having being tied to if the execution framework supports it or not. And that was definitely super fun to implement. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, Spotify has added, got a Scala mm -hmm. SDK for this. Do you know of any other SDKs currently in development? Yeah, so there are open Jira issues about writing a Go SDK. And we also, there's a branch developing a SQL SDK. Um, so those two are definitely in progress. And uh, the Spotify one is open source on their account on GitHub. And then Beam internally has checked in versions for Java and Python. And if you want to write a new SDK, you're definitely welcome to, and we'll be definitely supportive of that. Yes. Yes, so it's already implemented. In, it's in the Beam Master and really is released with every Beam version. Yeah. With the C sharp, yeah. That's a good question. We are on, uh, actually at Microsoft, of course, so is there any uh, .NET language currently listed for an SDK? Uh, no, but you're welcome to start a Jira issue and <laughs> starting a branch to help contribute on that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Sarah.